All of you joining us here today for this live and ticking British Heart Foundation Edinburgh Science Festival session. My name is James Jopling. I'm the head of British Heart Foundation in Scotland, and it's a pleasure to see so many of you joining us. Each month, we're delighted to bring you the latest British Heart Foundation news and introduce you to pioneering British Heart Foundation funded researchers from across the country. This edition is an Edinburgh Science Festival special about our research into air pollution and is also part of our 60th anniversary summer series, which focuses on our research highlights over the past 60 years. Back in 1961, a group of cardiologists and philanthropists came together, recognising the burden of cardiovascular disease across the country. Cardiac events such as heart attacks were taking thousands of lives away from our friends and families. In response to that challenge, the British Heart Foundation was established to fund research that could lead to better prevention, diagnosis and treatment of the heart and circulatory diseases that were killing hundreds of thousands of people. Now, we've come so far in 60 years and are immensely proud to have funded some of the world's greatest cardiovascular breakthroughs. From understanding the cause of heart attacks to proving the lifetime benefits of statins, we've much to celebrate, but we're no means done. With your support, we're looking forward to the next 60 years that the British Heart Foundation can bring and that research will make progress in. Today, we're thrilled to be joined by two of, uh, of our British Heart Foundation funded researchers from the University of Edinburgh. Dr. Mark Miller, the Senior Research Fellow at the British Heart Foundation Centre of Cardiovascular Science, and Professor David Newby, BHF Duke of Edinburgh Chair of Cardiology at the BHF Centre of Research Excellence both of whom are experts and are at the forefront of our understanding of the damage that air pollution can have on our heart and circulatory health. Now, BHF has funded over five and a half million pounds of research into the effects of air pollution on the heart and circulatory system. This pioneering research we've funded includes some of the first to understand the impact of diesel exhaust on heart health and has helped to shed light on how pollution, especially fine particulate matter, may be linked to an increased risk of heart attack and stroke. Now, we've also been at the forefront of efforts to increase both public and political awareness of the impact of air pollution. We launched a major campaign in early 2020, which aimed to show how it can damage heart and circulatory systems and argue for the introduction of stricter limits on pollutants in the air that we all breathe. Now, our campaign aimed to secure these stricter limits within a piece of legislation led from Westminster, the Environment Bill, through which the government set out to deliver a new target for those fine particulate matter levels. However, it's been clear for a while that there is no real safe level of air pollution. And while we've welcomed the recognition from the Westminster government of the impact of particulate matters on health, as well as a commitment to setting a target, they've yet to agree to the World Health Organization's recommended limits. So while that um, legislation is still making its way through Parliament, the BHF will continue to make the case for those stricter limits on air pollution. Now, both of our speakers today have been funded by British Heart Foundation throughout their careers. And that's just some of the research investment the British Heart Foundation has made here in this country, which totals over 55 million pounds worth committed over nine institutions in six cities up and down Scotland. That includes the Centre of Regenerative Medicine here in Edinburgh uh, and the Glasgow Cardiovascular Research Centre. But we fund in total of around 130 early career researchers renowned in renowned academic institutions right across this country. The really important thing to know is that all of our research is reliant on the public, on people like you. From people doing the kilt walk, to going into our shops, to donate and to buy secondhand clothes. We need all of that to make this work happen. We also work to ensure in Scotland things like the introduction of the new opt-out organ donation law. We've worked to ensure that all high school children will be trained in, in CPR so that they can help at the time when someone might have had an out of heart hospital cardiac arrest. But we couldn't do any of this work without all of you. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Mark Miller and Professor Dave Newby, who will be sharing their BHF funded research into air pollution related to heart and circulatory diseases. So it's now over to Dave and Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Let me just share my screen with you. Oh, hang on. I do apologise. Excuse me a second, I'm just having a few technical difficulties.
There we go. Hopefully you can see my screen now. So thank you very, once again, James, and of course thank you to the British Heart Foundation and the Edinburgh Science Festival for allowing us to, to speak in our research today. And as James has mentioned, our research looks at the health effects of air pollution. Um, and that's something I'd like to, to tell you about today. Now, I think most people tend to be aware of air pollution because it's very, very rarely out of the newspapers, it's very rarely out of the media, and it's high up in the political agenda in but most nations. But, of course, you're probably asking, do we not have bigger things to worry about? And that's hard to argue against. Of course, we have our pandemic, we have the looming threat of climate change, we have the consequences of... of um, various political decisions. And of course, all these are major things that we should worry about on top of our daily lives, like, like what we're going to feed the children for the, uh, the dinner. So on this front, why should we worry about air pollution? Well, I'd like to give you a, a list of facts really telling you why I think we should not forget about air pollution on, on, uh, behind all these other things that we have to worry about. So perhaps I can start with the most striking statistic, and that's that air pollution is responsible for seven to nine million uh, premature deaths every single year. Um, and that's a huge figure. It's a really striking figure that no matter how many times I say it, I still find staggering. This is well above what you would expect to see for most infectious diseases, even after years like we've just gone through. Um, another reason is that air pollution affects everyone. Of course, you will hear a lot about how people who are very young and people who are elderly are affected by air pollution. But what I want to bear out is that everybody is affected by air pollution. Whether you're a young, healthy and fit adult, whether you're a person who has a health condition. And of course, air pollution affects us across our whole life. It even affects us when we're unborn babies in the womb. The next fact I'd like to point out is that air pollution uh, damages all different areas of the body. So uh, we're well aware of the effects that air pollution has on the lungs and now over the last few decades we've become increasingly aware of the effects it has on the cardiovascular system and organ systems like the lung, the liver, the gut, the kidney, um, it's on our bones, our blood. It's been associated with conditions such as diabetes, and it's been linked to conditions even uh, as widespread as things like Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Now, one of the reasons that, of course, that air pollution is linked to so many early deaths across the world is, of course, that uh, the, the startling fact that everyone's exposed to air pollution. Indeed, over 90% of the world's population lives in levels of air pollution that are above recommended levels. And this is clearly worse in some areas of the world compared to others, but we shouldn't be complacent here in Europe, of course, because we're well aware now that there is no safe level of air pollution. So that brings us to air pollution in the UK. And historically, the UK has been important for air pollution because of episodes like these. So these are some images of the 1952 uh, London smog, where we had these thick pea supers that uh, ran through uh, a course of about five days. They even darkened the sky during these days. This is actually an image taken during the day rather than at night. Um, and what you can also look at uh, for these is you can look at the amount of uh, deaths that were registered during this time and during this period of uh, five days which is marked in this uh, grey column here there was a huge spike in the number of deaths that were registered during this time and it's really sort of brought to the attention that air pollution can actually kill. Of course though we don't see episodes like this in the uh, in the UK today and actually air, uh, air pollution is relatively modest in the UK so uh, relatively low levels of air pollution, as shown on this map of the UK, has the darker blue colours. So you can see, apart from really sort of the hot spots around major cities, the air pollution is relatively low. Additionally, it's also important to point out that air pollution is getting better. So this is a graph just showing uh, one pollutant, so this is the particles in the air, and it's looking over the last 30 years, and you can see that the levels of this pollutant have been steadily falling. Uh, over the last 30 years. This has somewhat flattened out over the, over the last decade or so, but it is still slowly falling. But nonetheless, even at these low levels of air pollution, uh, you do see health effects. And in fact, it's now been estimated that around 2,000 excess deaths are caused by air pollution just in Scotland, in this, uh, a relatively small region. 
I'll give you a quick quiz now while uh, Scotland is still clinging into the United Kingdom. Perhaps I can just ask you, in the UK itself, how many deaths are thought to be caused by air pollution every year? And I'll give you three choices. Is it 5,000, 10,000 or 30,000? I hope that what you have selected is 30,000. And in fact, the actual statistics are for the two major air pollutants in our uh, environment, the number of early deaths caused by these are up to the region of about 36,000 every single year. And these are really large numbers, and the large numbers that tend to go unnoticed year on out. So where is the air pollution coming from? Well, it's coming from lots of different places. It can come from the sort of sources that most people recognise air pollution is associated with, like industry, with traffic. It can also be uh, produced by different forms of traffic, such as uh, aviation and shipping. There are natural sources of air pollution, desert dust, sea salt, and sort of natural events like volcanic uh, eruptions and wildfires. And there's other sources of air pollution which we're only really just starting to get a good grasp of now. For example, the air pollution in our homes, be that very, that is very different both in developing nations compared to uh, nations that are well developed. Um, there are newer sources, for example, not just uh, the air pollution that's produced from the exhaust of vehicles, but also from the wear of the roads and the tyres and the brake wear. And agriculture is another major source of air pollution that we need to look into in more detail. This produces a, a huge amount of uh, air pollution particles, not just in rural environments, but in our cities as well. What is it in this air pollution that's there? Well, air pollution is a huge mixture of uh, rather unpleasant chemicals. We tend to categorise this into three different categories, that is gases, liquids and particles. But this is a big simplification. So within each of these categories, there are many different air pollutants, things like nitrogen dioxide, uh, nitric oxide, carbon monoxide, ozone. There are different liquid species, so this VOC stands for volatile organic carbon species, and there's a whole host of these different chemicals. And there are particulates as well, there's many different types of particulates. And actually all these different air pollutants do have the capacity to harm people's health. What we tend to find, though, is when we look at population studies, uh, it tends to be the particles that are most harmful. And this is especially true for cardiovascular disease. So I'm going to show you a little bit of data from a classic study that was done in 1993 called the Six Cities Study. And it was called the Six Cities because the researchers took six different cities in the USA, and these cities had different levels of air pollution. And what they did was the uh, plotted, they, they measured the amount of air pollution in these cities and then they showed them on this graph and the letters are each of the six different cities and then they also looked at death certificates and they looked to see how many people have died of a lung or heart disease at the same time as the air pollution and you can see there's a really clear uh, association between the levels of uh, the particles in the air and your risk of dying of lung or heart disease and this sort of remained true if you try and get rid of lots of different confounding variables. So if you do statistics to account for smoking. This is lung and heart disease. I'll just show you some worldwide statistics uh, from a study that also looked at um, uh, the causes of death. So this is the number of deaths, uh, early deaths caused by air pollution every year worldwide. And you can see it's increased substantially over the last 25 years. And the different colours of these graphs marks what the cause of the deaths were that were linked to air pollution. And you can see that two thirds of this is linked to cardiovascular disease, so stroke and ischemic heart disease. Coming back to particles in particular, so particles, they're not all the same. They, can put, they come from lots of different sources and they're made up of lots of different things. Another factor is, that there are also lots of different sizes. So this is shown here by this uh, nice figure where we have a grain of beach sand or human hair and the air pollution particles have been drawn on either in blue or the even smaller particles in red. And this is important because this is the way that air pollution is measured in our environments and um, it's also the way that they're regulated. 
and there's two categories that you probably have heard of in news headlines. This is PM, which stands for particulate matter, and it has a diameter of less than 10 micrometers. This is the blue dots on this graph. And then the PM 2.5, these are the red dots that are even smaller. And both these particles, they're a fraction of the width of a human hair, and in fact they're both invisible to the human eye. And you can measure these air pollutants and you can check what the air pollutants are in your different areas. So you can go to online sites and you can look all across the world and you can find out what the air pollution monitors are and the readings they have. So this was a reading showing a number of key air pollutants that was in Edinburgh a few days ago and I'm pleased to say that it was good. So everyone in Edinburgh was smiling this day. What I have said of course before is that air pollution is falling. Well that again that is true. So this is a more complicated graph to show this where I've plotted lines of lots of different air pollutants over the last sort of 40 years. And I'm going to highlight on the graph PM10 and PM2.5, and you can see these have steadily been declining during this time. What this completely overlooks, though, is during the same sort of time period, there's been a huge surge in the number of cars on our roads. Um, and with cars comes this, comes the car exhaust. And within this exhaust are many millions of different uh, of particles. And these particles are important because they're actually much smaller than PM10 and PM2.5. This is now a third category of particles that we call ultrafine PM, or nanoparticles. And these are the particles that we think are especially important to our health. So I've shown here on a, a scale bar to give you an idea of the size of these particles. So we're going from big down to small. And this moves down from the size of a hair towards cells, to bacteria, to viruses, to molecules. And nanoparticles fall in this size range here. So they're so small, they're smaller than most viruses, smaller than the coronavirus. And the reason, uh, one of the reasons we are concerned about these is that these particles, because they are so small, they're not adequately measured by uh, PM10 and PM2.5 monitors. Yet, even though they're so small, we have this huge surface area of these particles, and that means they can carry large amounts of many harmful different chemicals into the body. Also, these particles are the ones that get deep down into our lungs, and as we'll hear later on, potentially even further. And of course, the major source of nanoparticles in our environment, in urban environments in particular, is vehicle exhaust. And diesel exhaust in particular is especially rich in nanoparticles. And what I would do at this stage is I will hand over to Dave, and he will tell you a little bit more about the health effects they have on the health effects of diesel exhaust particles. Thanks very much, Mark. So um, Mark's giving me a lovely background into the scale of the problem across the world, uh, down to the local scale, and then giving you some idea about these particles. <clears throat> and these things are all linked. But the question is, OK, there's all these nice links and you've said all of these things in these associations. But how can you explain how the diesel exhaust or the, or the pollution is really affecting the body? What is it doing? is this just um, some strange association so uh, what i'd like to do is share with you some experiments that we've done so if you could move to the next slide please mark uh, and what we did um, was we collaborated with some colleagues and this is uh, uh, thomas sangstrom and anders blomberg uh, and they live in the north of sweden of course north of sweden um, a bit like edinburgh's smiley face i suppose has a uh, very healthy air so why do we go to, all the way to Northern Sweden? Well, uh, these two chaps were uh, respiratory physicians. So they looked after people's lungs and they've been studying pollution effects on the lungs. And uh, I wanted to study pollution effects on the heart and the circulation. So we, we agreed to collaborate. And so we went up to see them in the North of Sweden, did a whole series of experiments. And this is uh, how we did the experiments. Uh, what we're seeing is rather a dirty garage and in it, on the right-hand side, there is a, a blue diesel tractor engine. Uh, of course, it's a Volvo one, being from Sweden. Uh, and then the exhaust from that tractor engine goes out the window through the black pipe. But you can see a large silver pipe going through a wall there. Uh, and just as Mark's showing you there, highlighting, there's a tiny little pipe that goes into that big silver pipe. And that's essentially hiving off a small amount of the diesel exhaust and then diluting it down. And then that's pumped through the wall. Uh, and if you could advance there, Mark, and 
through the other side of the wall, there's a nice exposure chamber where the poor unsuspecting volunteer is cycling away uh, in this environment. And through that mechanism, we can study controlled exposures of diesel exhaust to people who are cycling or resting in a polluted environment and then assess and do various technical measurements. Now, I can just hear what you're all thinking uh, along the lines of, is this really ethical, David? What are you doing? Putting people in a chamber and uh, gassing them with diesel exhaust. Well, before you get too worried, the levels that we put inside this chamber are the levels that you could expect to experience on the roadside of a polluted day in central London. So this is not massive levels of air pollution. This is the sort of pollution that you might experience on a polluted day walking down the high street. So we expose people to do that. So then the question is, okay, you've exposed them. How are you going to assess what it does to the body? So next slide, please, Mark. So what we did is what we call a blood vessel stress test. <clears throat> so basically, you're not that stressed, as you can see, you're lying on the bed. And what we do is we put some equipment uh, around the arm and in the arteries of the arm to see how well the body is responding. And we, we prod the artery with some chemicals to see whether it will relax and whether it can respond to any stress. So as I said, it's a bit like a, a, basket, a blood vessel stress test, a bit like putting yourself on the treadmill for your blood vessels. And what we're able to show is that when you've been exposed to the pollution, uh, the diesel exhaust fumes uh, and particles, uh, that your ability to, for your arteries to relax was reduced and the ability of your arteries to react to blood clots was also reduced, as Mark's indicated here. So essentially what it's doing is dampening down your body's defense mechanisms. And of course, that makes you more susceptible uh, to your blood vessels tightening up and not enough blood flowing and essentially your arteries clotting off with blood clots. And that, of course, is what happens when you have a heart attack. Your heart artery tightens up and a blood clot forms. So does it really make a difference to blood clots? So the next slide, please, Mark. So another way that we did a test is to <clears throat> do this chamber study where we take uh, blood from a patient or a volunteer, as you can see, lying on the bed. They're usually pretty relaxed, as you can see, quite happy volunteers. And we take blood from the arm down some tubes and through these three chambers that Mark's pointing out for you there. Uh, and in those chambers, there's a, a strip of a blood vessel taken from a pig, in fact, uh, which we tear in half, which is sort of a, a model of what happens when you have a heart attack, because inside your artery, often the lyria bursts and it exposes the deep layer of the artery. Uh, and that means a blood clot will form on it. And so this is a sort of an artificial way of testing whether your blood clot forms. And that's a nice histology slide, a section under the microscope showing the pink clot forming on top of the purple uh, aortic strip there. And what we did was we counted how much blood formed, quite crude really, I suppose, in some ways. And as you can see on the right hand side, we measured this at two hours and at six hours. And in the gray bars is when you've been exposed to the diesel, as opposed to filtered air, which is the open bars. And as you can see, we seem to be producing more blood clots when you've been exposed to this controlled exposure of diesel uh, exhaust. Next slide, please, Mark. So this was healthy volunteers. <clears throat> what about patients with heart disease? Is this really relevant uh, uh, to, to patients with, with uh, conditions, heart conditions? Next slide, please, Mark. So we did the same experiment in Sweden, but this time we took patients <clears throat> who'd had heart disease, they'd been treated, they were on appropriate tablets, uh, and um, uh, we again put them through our little chamber, but this time we put monitors on them to monitor their heart. And there's a certain um, area of the monitoring uh, on the electrocardiogram of the heart, the electrical activity of the heart, which we look for, uh, which is called ST segment depression. And that essentially is a measure of how uh, stressed your heart is and how well it's working. And the more depressed the depression is, or the segment is, uh, the more stress your heart's in. And as you can see in the bottom panel there, when they were filtered, uh, uh, um, exposed to filtered air, they were pi pi pedaling on the bike. Yes, there was some element of heart stress, but when they did exactly the same activity in the diesel exhaust, the red bar there, you can see that it's much more stressed and it copes less well. And these individuals actually didn't know whether they were in a polluted environment or not. Uh, we actually didn't tell them, they did it twice. So they, they actually matched each other. Uh, and as you can see on the right hand side there, when you took all that data and looked at it as a single measure, 
the diesel exhaust essentially um, was associated with twice the, the stress for the heart as if it was filtered air. Next slide, please, Mark. So, okay, David, you've seen all these effects, but how the hell does the air pollution do this? Because, of course, it just goes into the lungs, doesn't it? And, of course, it does. And these particles, the sizes that Mark shared with you, they're so small, like a virus, uh, size of a virus particle or smaller, they can get deep down into the lungs. People often think about coal miners, and surely that's bad. Well, it is bad, but it's a different thing. The particles there are so big, they get usually clogged up in the upper airways. These particles are so fine, it's almost like a gas. They get right down deep, deep, deep into the lungs. Next slide, please, Mark. And uh, when you get down deep into the lungs and they're so small, the question is, where do they go? Well, they're quite hard to track, actually, because they're so small, so fine, that how the hell will we capture them? And it's very much like looking for a needle in a haystack, although I might argue that it might be easier to find a needle in a haystack than some of these pollutant particles because they are so, so small and it's very hard to track them. And of course, they're made of carbon. And of course, the body has lots of carbon within it, usually in molecules rather than particles alone. So it's very difficult to track these things. Next slide, please, Mark. So we hit on the idea of a golden idea, in fact, of using gold nanoparticles. So what we did is we took some very expensive bars of gold and uh, we actually made nanoparticles out of them. I won't bore you with how we did that, but we generate them to the same size as the particles that get uh, emitted from the diesel engines. Now, these particles are inert. They're not covered in all the horrible chemicals and gases that, that Mark was talking about. So they're quite inert and don't do anything. And of course, that's why gold is used for jewelry because it doesn't change, it's inert, it, it, it doesn't cause problems. But your body doesn't contain any gold. So uh, if you find it in the body, it must have come from outside the body. So we got people to breathe in these nanoparticles of gold. And as you can see on the left hand side there, this is a sort of gives you an idea of how small these particles are. Little black dots in the bottom left hand side there. There's indicative of the size of particles. And what you can see on the rest of the slide is what's called a scanning electron microscopy of lung tissue which means that it's put through a very sophisticated high resolution uh, 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 microscope and it gets down to the size of blood vessels. So the pink there that you can see are the blood vessels. And in fact, the darker red bits within it are the single red blood cells. So you can see how small these particles are and how easy it might be for those to slip across the membrane that's between the lung and the blood what we call the alveolar membrane, which is how oxygen, a gas, diffuses into the bloodstream, how easy those particles could slip across into the bloodstream. Next slide, please, Mark. So we did this in some healthy volunteers. We exposed them to these tiny little golden particles and we got them to breathe them in. And we get them in two different sizes, um, mostly to see how, you know, what, which ones escape. And then we took blood off them repeatedly over the following days and weeks. And what you can see there in the bar chart is that we can detect this gold um, uh, hours after they've been breathed in. So uh, they do get into the bloodstream and actually they persist for many days, probably because they're so small, they evade everything in the body and they accumulate within the body. So you can see a quite a nice signal. The larger particles were less good. So it is a question of size. And this is perhaps why air pollution is so toxic, because it is so small that it can get across where other particles would not get across. Um, so the question again is, OK, that's healthy volunteers, David. What about in patients? How does it affect those with disease? So next slide, please, Mark. So we hit on the idea of doing this exposure of gold to patients having a specific operation, which is being shown to you on the left. And this is someone's artery in their neck. And this operation is used to treat patients who have stroke, who have a lot of furring up of the artery in the neck to remove the furring up. And that's what you're actually seeing. This is what it is, the furred up segment of the artery. And what we did is the day before they had their operation, we got them to breathe in the gold. And then when the, the um, operation was performed and they had this area of thickening removed from their body, we put it under our microscope again. And that's what you can see on the right hand side here. And the two different uh, figures there show uh, one person on the left who didn't get exposed to the gold and someone on the right that did. And as you can see in the red sort of staining within that article is an area of gold collection. And the, and the graph above it 
is a special technique called Raman spectroscopy, which is quite sophisticated. But the control one is the blue line, so nothing really happened there. The patient wasn't exposed. Uh, but the black line is the gold particles on the glass slide, and the red line is the gold particles within the tissue that's been removed. So what this tells us is these small particles, yes, they get into the bloodstream, but they do tend to separate out in areas of damaged blood vessel in this thickened area. And perhaps that's why it triggers heart attacks and strokes and the like is because it's inflaming and annoying and, 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 and really um, causing problems for the blood vessel uh, because it tends to separate out exactly at the point where there's the most disease. So hopefully that's given you a flavor of uh, some of our research from the, the basic concepts of what we've achieved in terms of, of, of uh, observing across the world the impact of air pollution through what air pollution actually is, right down to how we've done some controlled exposure studies in people to try and understand how and what the mechanism of these harmful effects of air pollution. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Dave and Mark, for that presentation. Uh, I found it really fascinating and gave us a real insight into this particular challenge and area of work. Um, now, we've got some questions that have come in um, from our supporters, from the general public. Um, so I'm just going to ask those on their behalf. And I mean, either of you chip in as you see fit, depending on um, whether you want to kind of take the lead on answering them. And um, we'll see how many we can get through in the next few minutes. Uh, so uh, first up, um, is diesel the only pollutant that can damage or affect the heart and circulatory system? I'm happy to go first. Yeah, so it, it's not. It's not not by any means. There's lots of different air pollutants. Uh, as we uh, mentioned earlier, there's the order particles and they come from different sources and they're made of different things. And a large, um, uh, a large amount of these different particles of different types can harm the body. Um, but some more so than others. Then there's also gases as well, which we haven't gone into a lot of detail. And they also have sort of properties which can, can damage the body, damage the lungs and the cardiovascular system. So each of these different things has features which we think are, are going to be problematic for health. The th reason we want to focus on the very small particles is though, is they have lots of these different features that will harm health. You know, they, they have this ability to get deep into the body, to build up in areas of vascular disease. Um, and also they've got lots of chemical reactions happened on the surface. So that these uh, particles in particular, they're, they're oxidizing. So that's a bit like metal rusting in the rain. So these particles get to the body and in many ways, they sort of almost make the, the body rust in places. Um, so it's all these different features together leads us to think that, you know, this is one of the key air pollutants. Uh, that's harmful to health and it's also something we can do something about. Dave, anything to add on that or? <clears throat> Not really, I, th I think, um, you know, in terms of vehicles, certainly as Mark has already mentioned, the diesel is particularly bad because it generates 50 times as much particles as, as, as um, uh, petrol engines. But there, there are um, lots of, um, you know, um, pollution that comes from um, other burning of fossil fuels, so, you know, power stations and the like. And, and industry, which are also contributing. Uh, and there's also road materials, um, there's agriculture, as Mark's already alluded to, so lots of complicated elements to it. But as he said, as Mark says, just to reinforce it, it's the combustion-derived nanoparticles, these really tiny things that seem to cause a lot of the problems. Okay, thank you. Um, question now from uh, a BHF supporter, Ivan Williams. Uh, I have various health conditions which can share similar symptoms, atrial fibrillation, COPD, sleep apnea. I was interested to know if the findings in the research program from your work on air pollution strengthen the link with cardiovascular conditions like those. I'll let you go first, so, Dave. Yeah, I think, um, uh, I suppose there are many manifestations of cardiovascular disease. Um, there is certainly air pollution. There is some uh, suggestion that there's a link between rhythm problems of the heart and air pollution. Um, and, but of course, there are other ways of uh, the air pollution affects the body. The ones I've talked about mostly have been about heart attacks. And of course, if you have a heart attack, you're more likely to have a rhythm problem. And if you have a heart attack from air pollution, you're probably likely, more likely to have a rhythm problem even more. So these things do all interact uh, and do interdigitate. Um, does it explain the associations between those diseases? Not necessarily, but they all are part of the mix as it were. Excellent. Mark? 
I would very much agree on, on that as well. So I think what has been so uh, good about this BHF programme of research, what has been so enlightening, is the fact that you know air pollution is not just having an effect on the heart or on the blood vessels, it's having lots of different effects throughout the cardiovascular system. And these all add up. And of course, as I did myself, people tend to concentrate on the risk of, of dying, and that's dying the heart attack, uh, dying of uh, a stroke, an event like that. But you also have to bear in mind as well that what's going on before that happens, and heart disease is a really insidious disease. It's one that builds up over many years, many decades, and it tends to be silent. And the air pollution is affecting that as well. You know, it's making you more likely to develop cardiovascular disease if you're healthy, as well as all having these terrible consequences afterwards. Thank you. Um, a, a very topical question here. Um, has the COVID-19 pandemic caused air pollution levels to drop? And, and what's your, what are your views on how that, that might impact and how long that impact might be in terms of, of you know, the, what might happen for patients with cardiovascular diseases? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It's the dreaded C word again that we're all sick of hearing. <laughs> um, it, uh, it did have an effect. So the pandemic itself, and more importantly, the lockdown that was enforced with the pandemic, that did lower air pollution. So as people had less activity, they drove less, there were less flights, air pollution did fall. And when we were in the early stages of a lockdown, I think the, the, the data that was coming out was, was quite striking. There were really big reductions in air pollutants. So if we look at the two major air pollutants, that's nitrogen dioxide and uh, PM 2.5. So nitrogen dioxide fell up to about 40% in some countries and the PM 2.5 fell to around sort of 25% in some countries. So it did have an effect on these. Um, I think the feeling now is that the effects might have been uh, a little bit less than we thought, so not a striking of reduction as we thought. And I think now as we see even normal activity is starting to resume, it's not completely resumed, but starting to resume, these levels have gone up to uh, very close to what they were before the lockdown. So it's it's uh, a little bit disappointing that you know that perhaps we we haven't managed to reduce air pollutants long term but i think it's been useful because it raises awareness of what people can do if we change our behaviors we can really uh, tackle air pollution thank you dave anything from you on that no i i agree completely with mark and it was quite amazing how the, how things cleared and and you know you saw reports of how you could actually see fish in in the sea for a change rather than it being constantly churned up Mm -hmm. the you know the air pollution levels coming really down and the thing that heartened me was that uh, bike sales went through the roof and uh, people were buying bikes which is exactly what we want we want people cycling to work we want people uh, exercising more uh, and and there is an opportunity here to change our, our, our behavior to be part of the solution here because it's all too easy to say oh well the government's got to fix this for us well no mm -hmm. you can actually get on your bike and uh, literally mm -hmm. uh, and that will make a difference so you know i'd encourage people listening to this that you know change your lifestyle try and avoid using uh, uh, road traffic where able and particularly if you're commuting short distances or getting the train or whatever try and use better forms of transport thank you uh, why wise words indeed um i'm going to link two questions now that we've had together uh, one is about um whether air pollution created in a town or city stays in that area or can it travel further distances from country to country um, and it's a slightly clunky connection, but I, I wonder if you can reflect a bit more on the global efforts to address this issue. I mean, you've talked about the work you've done with colleagues in Sweden. What else is happening on a global level that's informing work you've done already or might, might inform work in the future? That's a big question. So I'll try to give you a, a big answer to that. Um, yeah, so air pollutants don't just stay in one place. Um, and it depends on the air pollutant that you're looking at in terms of uh, how far they're carried or what happens in the air when they're carried. Um, but it's certainly true. When you look at something like the, the fine particles, the PM 2.5 in the air, these can stay in the air for quite a long period of time and they can travel uh, quite far distances. So it's not just the, the uh, case, for example, that if you're uh, living in a city, you have polluted air, some of that pollution will get out to the air. And the other is also true as well. So I mentioned agricultural pollutants. And one of the reasons that's coming to attention is uh, some of these agricultural pollutants, they come into the air and then they react with other air pollutants and they make small particles. 
and these can be carried really long distances, so many hundreds of different miles. So actually, uh, a lot of the air pollution in cities may actually be from the air pollution that comes in rural environments. And this does make things very difficult, very difficult for policy makers and leaders of nations because air pollution does travel, uh, air pollution does travel from uh, different nations. So we do have, for example, some of the Saharan dust that's blown up from North Africa will come over to the UK and that will make, uh, that will make some of the, the air pollutant particles that we measure in the UK. And then other nations as well, have, there's a lot more common to have, for example, crop burning and uh, wildfire burning. Uh, and those sort of particles can travel long distances. And I have seen some, uh, on some occasions different nations saying, well, you know, the air pollution in our country is the responsibility of another country. And that, that's unfortunate. Uh, on the positive side, I would also say that there is a real international effort to research air pollution. And now as air pollution reaches the top of the political agenda, the success stories of people who have managed to reduce different air pollutants, they are being looked at by the rest of the world and uh, put in place in other parts of the world. So it's undoubtedly a, a global effort both to understand the health effects of air pollution and do something about them. Fantastic. Good to hear. Dave, anything from you? Yeah, one of the comments I just want to make, um, which is not contradicting what Mark says, but just to highlight the feature. Um, <clears throat> air pollution can spread and, and there are no boundaries. It doesn't respect international boundaries. But the other aspect of air pollution is there will be a concentration effect, so particularly around roads. So if you look at the air pollution level, as you move away from a road, it exponentially decays. Um, so when you're looking at concentrations of air pollution it is quite marked close to the road so for example if you look at how much heart disease people have it actually goes up the closer they live to a road so the amount of heart artery disease you have goes up the nearer the road to a, to a road you live uh, and particularly in big cities um, so there is a, an element that you know if you live right next door to a road or high traffic um, you know through through ways you will be exposed to more than somebody who lives uh, many hundreds of meters away from a road um, so that is an element to that of course it will dilute itself down but it will spread as mark describes but there is a concentration effect as well which we shouldn't ignore and i think that's that's a very good point because it highlights that not all air pollutants are the same so when we look yes. at the large particles these are the ones that uh, don't uh, tend to fall much for example from wherever the source comes but we were really interested in the the very small particles from the vehicle exhaust and those are the ones that fall rapidly as you go distance from a major road so even though our air pollution monitors might be sort of uh, might not be detecting these sort of fall offs um, the actual health effects could still be there so it's important to bear in mind the source of the air pollution um one last question that we have time for, and I mean, it's, got, it's very, very forward thinking, I, and I hope we, we have positive uh, answers for the people watching, but is air pollution an issue that will continue to affect cardiovascular health, or can you see a point when it will be eradicated someday? That's, a, that's another great question. So if we, again, if we just look at the particles in the air, it's unlikely we're going to eradicate it because there is a substantial proportion of that that doesn't come from human activities. It comes from things like sea salt, from uh, uh, different dusts and things in the air. But of course, these might be the pollutants that are not as harmful as all the other air pollutants. So it's a really sort of case of this, most of the most of the research tells us that it's the man-made air pollutants that are really harmful, and these are the things that you can make big changes for. And the levels of these will fall substantially. So as we move to the electrification of vehicles, um, that will slowly reduce the levels of these particles that come from the exhaust in the air. But there's other things we have to bear in mind. So the, uh, just looking at traffic itself, we can try and tackle the exhaust fumes, but there will be still be particles from the brake wear. So from cars braking, from the tire wear, from the road wear. And I think lots of attention and, uh, is starting to go into these things because we know these air pollutants will stay with us for a while, but we don't know what the health effects are. David, anything from you? <clears throat> no, I, I think Mark's actually knocked, knocked, knocked the nail on the head there. Um, we're not going to get rid of particles in the air for sure. Yeah. we are going to be able to get rid of a lot of the harmful particles if we do things right and that's the challenge and uh, it's it's achievable well i i think that's a great point to, to leave our question session on um huge thanks to professor newby and dr miller for their contributions to the session today 
And thank you to all of you for, for joining us in, in a way we, we, we never imagined we would have to, but um, hopefully you've, you've learned a lot from this session. Um, a reminder that this is uh, recorded and will be available on the Edinburgh Science Festival YouTube site for the remainder of the festival and on the British Heart Foundation's own website from the 12th of July. Um, we hope uh, if this has sparked an interest from your perspective in our work and in research in cardiovascular diseases, you'll join us for our next 60th anniversary live and ticking event, which is taking place on Wednesday, the 21st of July. And you can find out more information on that, share it with your friends and family on our public events page of our website. And just to finish, um, I've mentioned it a couple of times, the work that you've heard about today, all of the work the British Heart Foundation does to research and understand more about how we can beat heartbreak forever, relies on the donations from the public up and down the country. If you feel you can support us, and we welcome that very much, um, and we've been hit really hard by the impacts of COVID like so many other charities, please do visit our website. You can make donations there, um, and it would really be most welcome. And a thank you uh, from me if you do do that, and a thank you from me and our speakers and the whole of BHF for joining us here today. Thank you very much.